Hi, and welcome to the Solve Your Running Injury webinar. My name is Jay Grunke, and I'm, the, I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner. And I'm leaning the computer farther away from my... <laughs> Hello, Matthew here. So we get distracted here, you see that. Um, I'm going to take a sec to... Okay. okay. So um, I have just muted everybody, but hopefully myself. But there'll be opportunities to ask questions in this webinar, so um, you'll be able to unmute yourself to ask a question. And if you're having trouble with that, just wave your hand at me or send me a message in the chat box, and I'll unmute you. Um, so um, I have been a Feldenkrais practitioner for uh, 13 years, especially seeing and working with runners. I'll tell you a bit more about my background and how I came to this in a little bit. Um, but I have created this webinar um, because I see the same patterns over and over again. And, uh, and it's almost entirely, of course, injured runners who come to see me. So yeah, I had had the opportunity to see these patterns a lot. So um, people assume that running injuries are mostly about the injured area, that if you have pain somewhere, that's because there's something wrong in that area. And so this leads to a medical approach where you go to a doctor or a physiotherapist and they look at the area that hurts and um, uh, see if there's something wrong with that, if there's something that they can do um, to help heal that area. And now I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see this presentation that I've created. Um, uh, you uh, lucky people are attending my first webinar I've ever given. <laughs> and that will undoubtedly come across. So I'm grateful for your patience with me in this. Um, let me see. Zoom. What? Prezies. Here we go. All right, can everybody see uh, a big green sign that says solve your running injury? Um, good, all right, so. so. So this is the fundamental misconception, is that it's the, your running injury is about the area that's hurt, that there's some damage there, and that it needs to heal. But the reality is that the problem usually isn't damage, um, or at least not really significant damage that would make it actually impossible to run. Um, and it, the problem is stress. And we understand a lot more about how pain works than we used to understand. And we understand that pain comes not from your body, not from a damaged area of your body, but actually from your brain. And the decision to send a pain signal is your brain's evaluation of a situation that needs to be changed. And it is not necessarily any correlation to the amount of damage in an area, which is why a person can be badly injured but also in danger and therefore feel no pain until they've gotten themselves or the people that they love to safety. You know, it's the reason uh, I even remember my own most vivid experience of that. It was not nearly so traumatic. As a child, I shut my thumb in a car door, but the door, like, all the way shut, like, absolutely flush with the car. And I remember that moment of looking at my thumb in the shut door and, my, and freaking out, but I felt nothing in my hand. All I could feel was that I had to open the door. I got the door open. Uh, my parents came and hugged me, and the thumb started to swell, and then all of a sudden I felt a flood of pain. So if the pain were a product of the damage, I'd have felt it immediately because my thumb was <laughs> flattened right away, right? Um, so we now know that this is how pain works. And so when you feel pain, it's an evaluation of the situation. It doesn't mean that there's something broken. And it's, in fact, possible to have a phenomenal amount of pain without anything being actually broken or damaged to a point where it's unusable. And so 
um, your brain creates a, a pain signal as an early warning that you need to change the stresses that you're creating in your body to prevent there from being real damage. And it's fairly effective because it will general, generally stop a person running. And if you ignore mild pain, generally your brain will supply stronger pain <laughs> until you listen. But the, uh, if you respond to that pain by acting as if there were already damage there, by resting, and by doing all the traditional healing um, methods, such as icing, taking anti-inflammatory medication, getting massages, doing stretches and exercises, um, often the problem just comes back. And the reason why is because the one thing that you needed to change the way that you're stressing your body, the way that you're moving when you run, is the one thing that you haven't changed. And none of the other interventions that you did changed that. Rest doesn't change how you move, except for making you a bit stiffer and crankier. Um, nor do anti-inflammatory medications. And sometimes stretching and exercise do a bit. And that's why they sometimes work to some extent. But generally, or all too frequently, they don't change enough. And they don't make a positive enough change for you to be out of the woods. So the thing that you need to do, particularly if you have a running injury that has not responded to the conventional treatments, one thing that you need to do is change the way that you're moving. Relieve the stress on your body that your nervous system is concerned about and the pain will go away. And not only will the pain go away, but you'll actually run better than you did before because you've improved how you're moving. The, to, the changes in your movement that reduce the stress on your body are the very same changes that um, use your body the way that it really works, the way that you're meant to run. And that means that you'll run better. And so um, in, in that way, you avoid the trap of the runner who finds a way through, through you know, the kind of standard therapies to manage an injury. For instance, you might develop IT band syndrome. And um, you find that with foam rolling and icing and regular stretching, you're able to manage it. You're able to keep the pain under control. It doesn't get too bad. You barely feel it. You can still run and train, but you're always kind of on the edge and you're not running as well as you did last year. Um, and so that's because, again, you haven't enough changed the way that you're moving. You haven't relieved the stresses from your body. You're just managing them. It's symptom control. And in that case, yeah, you don't run as well as you did before. Again, improve the way that you move. And not only will your IT band syndrome not be a problem anymore, but your running will be better than it was last year. So, right, I forget which slides I have for which things, but there you have it in red and white. <laughs> so, let me tell you a little bit about how I learned all of this. And um, I'll actually duck out of screen share here because I've got a, a gap without slides. Let me see if I can do this in a relatively uh, smooth way. All right. So, um, I learned all of this a very hard and unpleasant way. I was actually not a runner. I was a professional dancer for 13 years of my life. And uh, for a while, it went okay. Um, I, had, uh, I had come to dancing late, as a um, uh, late teen rather than at age eight, when women usually begin their dance training. So I had played a lot of catch up and I had done a lot of sort of making my technique work however I could get it to work. And um, I developed really bad Achilles tendonitis in both feet. I had a year of physical, the standard physical therapy, you know, I iced, oh my goodness. I, I used all of the Arctic worth of ice <laughs> on my feet. It was sad. Um, and uh, uh, I went to a special dance injuries physical therapy center. 
and I got ultrasound. Um, the therapist rapidly discovered I could do every exercise that she knew for Achilles tendon tendonitis already because I was a dancer. I could balance on one foot. It wasn't hard. Didn't mean I didn't have Achilles tendon problems. Um, and so for a year, I didn't dance. I only got worse. And eventually, I saw another um, sports medicine doctor for a second opinion, and he said that I would probably never dance again. There was no point in physical therapy, and um, that was there was nothing I could do. That was that. Um, but uh, fortunately, um, a, a total busybody who I'd never met before in my life phoned me from where I worked, um, a friend of a friend who I'd never met, and she said, "I heard your story." And you need to have, have Feldenkrais lessons. You need to go see Franya. Here's her phone number. <laughs> and God bless all busybodies. Um, I I had I went to this Feldenkrais practitioner. I was walking without pain in about six weeks. And when I later went back to dancing, not only were my Achilles no problem at all, but I was a much better dancer than I had ever been before. Because all of the basic skills that needed to underpin ballet technique, the ability to balance on one leg easily, the ability to extend and flex and turn and jump, kid things. But the way the fundamental activities that our body needs to be able to do, they were just there for me. And then I could do it in a balletic style and it was easy. And it was from that point forward that I had the career that I wanted to have instead of never getting to dance again as the doctor had predicted. So um, I am forever grateful that I had that experience and I have um, dedicated my life to helping other people have that experience. So what was it exactly that I did and that I am a Feldenkrais method? So the Feldenkrais method is a method of movement education. So it's not exercises. It deals with what you know about how to coordinate your whole body together. And in um, current parlance, it powerfully and rapidly activates neuroplasticity in your brain, your ability to make new connections in your brain and, uh, by um, returning you to the way that you learned things when you were a child, when you originally learned how to move. And it was a time of tremendous uh, growth in your brain and very rapid learning. And we can access that again um, uh, through this particular method that was developed by a scientist named Moshe Feldenkrais beginning in the 1950s. He was a physicist and engineer and um, the first European black belt in judo. And he um, uh, became very interested in how to help, well, first himself with his injured knee, learn to walk again without surgery and without pain, and then to help his friends who wanted similar help and it grew from there into a method. And uh, so that's the simple background. And after this webinar, uh, when I share the replay with you, um, I will also send you a link to a very good excerpt from a, a book called The Brain's Way of Healing by Dr. Norman Doidge, um, which is about neuroplastic therapies, uh, one of the leading ones of which is the Feldenkrais Method. And so if you want to know more about what the method really is, um, this article, is, uh, which is available for free online, is a great place to start. All right, so I think I'm back to slides now, so let me attempt to share my screen again. Let me see, share screen, there it is. Oops, another button to press. I am, ooh, I'll just center that slide. Okay, so there you go. Um, the key thing that it makes the Feldenkrais Method such a powerful tool to help runners is that it helps you feel what you're doing. Because you can find well, tons of books at this point, and oh, you could be forever with Google on the computer, finding articles about your problem, um, pieces about running technique, YouTube alone, the number of videos on correct running technique is crazy. Um, and all of that information is very intellectual, and you can understand all the theory behind it. You can, and it can be completely correct, which not all of us out there is, but even if you had an utterly correct intellectual understanding of what you're to be doing, that's no good if you can't feel what to do. And so that's where the Feldenkrais Method excels in helping you feel what you're doing, um, what you need to do, and how to change. 
And when you have done a lot of Feldenkrais lessons, you have um, massively expanded self-awareness. So overall, you are so much better able to feel what you're doing and to make choices then about how you move. And the technical control that that gives you in a run or a race situation is unparalleled. Um, and I was actually uh, speaking with Melody Fairchild, which is a name you may or may not know. She was the first American girl to run under 10 minutes for the two mile. Um, and uh, she has um, been a professional runner for 22 years. She won five U.S. Masters um, uh, uh, championships in 2014. So really long stretch of phenomenal running. And she is also trained in the Feldenkrais method and does a lot of lessons herself. Um, and we were talking the other day about what it gives um, a runner in a race situation to have this kind of self-awareness. Um, and she felt that the, one of the biggest assets for her was that it let her make a much better informed decision about when to go and how to go and when to hold back. It's just she has so much more data. So, um, moving forward. So, with that background, um, let me share with you now. I, I went on to train in the Feldenkrais method, um, which I've now told you a lot about, and I've been working with runners for 13 years to do that. Um, to help them with their form runners from beginner to Olympian. And as I said at the outset, a lot of patterns have emerged. And um, I have also done a lot to keep on the, on the leading edge of conventional therapy so that I understand the other things that the runners I work with are doing. And I have come to see that conventional healing methods often fail for two main reasons because they address the symptoms and not the fundamental problem. I've told you a bit about that already, the fundamental problem being the stress created by how you move. But all of the treatments, the ice, the anti-inflammatories, the stretching, the exercises, and so forth, is meant to correct the pain in the part that hurts and not the movement pattern. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, oh, typo, in many cases, Research has already shown that the conventional methods don't promote healing as they're intended to. So even if they, even if they weren't the problem of them being just symptom management, they also don't manage symptoms the way they're supposed to. And so um, I'll tell you, let's go through a, a list of the classic ones. So stretching to begin with. So there's been a lot of... Um, Controversy about stretching, uncertainty about stretching over the years. When I started working with runners, um, the jury was still out on what, if any, benefit stretching had for runners. But if you have an injury and you go to a therapist and they discover that you're not very flexible, they'll give you stretches because surely that's part of the problem. However, um, the, in the last few years, it's become increasingly clear with the research being done that stretching. Static stretching, where you take a, a position in which you feel a stretch and you hold that position, it just causes muscle damage, and tissue damage, connective tissue damage. That's all that it does. And that's why you have greater range of motion after stretching because you tore the muscle a bit. Micro tears throughout, not like one rip clean through like in a piece of fabric. Um, and so then that has to heal. And when it heals, it's a, bit, it's a bit of scar tissue, so that makes it stiffer. So then you feel stiff, and you really need to stretch again. And what you end up with is a, 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 a chronically weakened muscle due to um, chronic micro tears. This is not productive for an athlete. It doesn't help. Um, so there are alternatives to stretching, and I'll share those with you in a little bit. So that's stretching. Now, there are other forms of stretching. Sorry, that was static stretching. There are other forms of stretching commonly all piled under the heading dynamic stretching, and those have a much more neurological effect, and they don't involve pulling and tearing your tissues, and so that's a healthier alternative. Um, uh, but generally speaking, unless you have a very up-to-date therapist that you're working with, they're going to give you static stretches. And then um, you're going to 
wealth maybe feel a bit better, but not all the way back to where you were before. Or you may develop subsequent problems that are from having your whole system destabilized by damaged muscles in one or two places. Um, or you'll feel like you're just on a, on a treadmill, so to speak, a hamster wheel, where you're just doing the therapy and doing the therapy, but it doesn't get better. So that's stretching. Icing. So, um, again, just in recent years, the research has added up to the point where it has become clear that ice does not promote healing. And this comes from a fundamental misunderstanding of the role of inflammation in injury. Um, very often with chronic injuries, you see chronic inflammation. And so it's easy to think it's the inflammation that's the problem. But inflammation is your body's healing process. The problem is that it's chronic. In other words, that the healing is not being accomplished. And uh, there are many reasons for that, one of which may be that you need to change how you move. And another of which may be that you're interfering with that healing process so it can never complete. So ice, because it constricts your tissues and reduces circulation, actually interferes with your healing process. It prevents lymph from carrying damaged tissue, cleaning the area up, carrying damaged tissue away, and blood from circulating new building materials in, nourishing the area and allowing it to repair. And this is true in both acute and chronic injuries. And that probably sounds like a shocker because that is really not widely known yet, but give it a few years. It takes on average 10 years for new scientific discoveries, well, a minimum of 10 years, to um, become well-known throughout the professional community. And so new discoveries in the, in the past two years or you know, um, the, the point where the research is mounted up to which, uh, where you have to start thinking about things differently, um, you know, it's, it's probably not going to filter down to all of the conscientious physiotherapists out there for a few years yet, especially since when you've been handling things one way for a long time, it's not so easy to suddenly realize that um, it was wrong and you need to change. So that slows the process down. All right, so icing, um, at, at, at this point, the only really, um, uh, the only reason to maybe use ice is for pain, pain relief, but there are other things that you can do about that for short-term pain relief. But to speed healing, Definitely avoid the ice. And this also goes for ice baths as a recovery technique. Same thing. You are interfering with inflammation, which is your body's um, recovery process from the workout that you just did. And you'll feel a bit better. But I, I once heard a coach saying that an athlete, um, an athlete of his you know, started a program of taking ice baths as recovery baths after every workout and a year later she felt a lot better than she'd ever felt but during that year of training she never got faster and so you have to take that into account um, in uh, uh, and avoid the ice so sim similarly for anti-inflammatory same principle applies inflammation is your body's healing process anti-inflammatory medication stops your body from healing and um, there's lots of evidence, different studies into different kinds of injury and damage, um, but for bone fractures, for sprains and so forth, that it um, inhibits stem cell activity and basically is going to prolong your healing. Um, there's also plenty of evidence that cortisone injections will have a similar and perhaps more potent effect because people who have cortisone injections tend to have, well, less pain right away. It feels like a relief. But six months later, they have not recovered as well as people with identical injuries who do not have cortisone injections. So um, rest. Well, uh, rest is a darn sight better than stretching, icing, or anti-inflammatories since it doesn't directly interfere with your body's healing process. However, um, if you totally, become totally sedentary, you don't have the circulation that you need to again nourish the area and allow it to heal. And so if you're not able to run um, because something hurts too much, 
it's very important that you find a way that you can be physically active um, without stressing the area, without making your recovery appear to slow down or your injury worsen. Um, and so that may mean a switch to, to cross training of some kind. That may mean that you walk or you cycle or you swim. Um, also aerobic exercise produces anti-inflammatory chemicals in the body. So, uh, uh, but, but it's not like taking an anti-inflammatory drug in that it helps regulate your inflammation. So again, your healing process is supported, but it doesn't run out of control. Um, and rust, of course, does not accomplish anything productive about improving how you move. That's the Nor is it very good for your move or your mood, as I'm sure that uh, your family members will be all too happy to tell you when you're injured. So um, next topic, footwear-based solutions. So this is, again, one of the really popular things out there. And this is range from motion control or stability shoes to orthotics. And... Um, the American College of Sports Medicine is quite clear in its running form, running shoe, running shoe recommendations released in April of 2014. So not all that new even anymore. Quite clear that orthotics should only be a short-term measure, six to eight weeks. Um, as, a, as a way of, again, relieving stress, what do orthotics do? They change how you move. Um, but that um, the, uh, 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 there should be a strategy to move a runner from orthotics into the kinds of strengthening and technique improvement process that will um, return them to health. That a, an orthotic should not be worn on an ongoing basis for the rest of your life. That would be like if you broke your leg and the doctor put a cast on and said, okay, so now you'll be wearing this for the rest of your life. What would you think of that doctor? You'd be horrified and you wouldn't accept it. And it's the same thing with ortho orthotics. Similarly with motion control and stability shoes, um, ACSM says that, um, that um, uh, a shoe should complement a strong foot rather than do the work of the foot. And that no runner should be wearing shoes with motion control or stability components. So, that again is no runner. So regardless of what they say in the running shoe store when they put you on the train treadmill and look at you with, on the video, um, regardless of whether you're over pronate, um, this is a sign that you need to change how you move and in ACSM's view, improve your strength, which in my view is a consequence of improving how you move. Um, and not a call for shoes that are going to actually interfere with the correct function of your foot. So um, ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine, the most authoritative advisory body um, in the United States on matters of fitness and health. That's their guidelines. Core stability exercise. So I realize that this is probably really going to be the most controversial. Well, these are all pretty controversial, right? Probably all a bit of a shock to you. But um, core stability exercise doesn't serve the biomechanical needs of runners. Uh, it's well established that the trunk needs to move when you run. That, in fact, the pelvis does move when you run. Um, and there's articulation of your spine. And so particularly the way core stability exercise is interpreted by um, what I find to be the majority of um, Pilates and movement teachers, therapists, and running magazine articles, um, where core stability is interpreted to mean holding your core still, keeping your hips, your pelvis from moving, and tightening your abdominals so that you don't have movement there. That is directly contrary to your biomechanical needs as a runner. Um, we have two legs, and neither one is in the middle, and there's no seat when you run. <laughs> so in running, when you move your weight from one foot to another, that needs to be somewhat a lateral move and somewhat a rotational move. Your center of gravity has to shift a bit from side to side because your legs don't come to the middle when you run. And so this is why core stability exercise, while it can be 
um, to some degree helpful. And I realize that it, a lot of runners do feel like their problems improve when they do core stability exercise. Um, very often that's just because of having a thorough and non-running form of activity that um, corrects and balances one side of the body to the other. Um, anything that you do, however, to hold your pelvis still and running is going to make some injuries worse and not better and is uh, going to hurt your performance relative to what, how you have the potential to run. And it's going to make running feel like it takes a whole lot more discipline and work than without trying to hold your course still. And um, if it feels like it takes more work, it does take more work. If it takes more work, it means that you um, are expending more energy, that you're running less economically. And using your body the way it really works can't possibly be less economical than the other alternatives. It could only be more economical. So that's why these six traditional strategies um, uh, have limited benefit for running injuries and can, in fact, make things worse, especially the first three. So what you need to remember is that most of the symptoms that you experience with a running injury are actually your body trying to solve the problem of faulty technique. And so there is a way that you can actually listen to your body and work with it rather than against it. Um, listen because it is giving you the clues to solving your problem. So instead of telling it to shut up, <laughs> my quads are sore. <laughs> Shut up. Stop being sore. <laughs> stop being tight. Instead, that's your clue as to the problem that your body is trying to solve, and you can work on that. And then, uh, then the second thing that you need to do is always and listen to your body and see if you can make your running feel easier. Because as I've said, I'll say it again, better running technique feels easier, not harder than bad running technique. Because better running technique uses your body the way it really works. You can feel the difference right away, not later when you're stronger. Because again, if you need to be stronger, it's not easier, it's harder. So, Knowing those things, keeping a general principle in mind, here are things that you can do on your next run. You can forget about core stability. Stop trying to hold your pelvis still. Stop trying to tighten your abdomen. And know that your pelvis must move. And you can also use your fatigue as a learning tool. The way that you start moving when you're getting tired is probably better than you were moving when you were fresh because when you're fresh, you have more energy to potentially fight yourself. When you begin to get tired, you stop having that extra energy and your nervous system will begin to make corrections to make running easier. And so typically, before you're completely exhausted, but when you're just beginning to feel a bit tired, Notice how you're running, and you will get clues as to what is actually would probably be a good running technique change for you to make from the outset. All right, here are some injury specific tips. So, if your problem is tight quads or hip flexors, and of course, I just blogged extensively about that. What you can do on your next run is try bringing your knees forward a little quicker. You are um, experiencing that tension because your weight is too far back. And one of the things that often holds your weight too far back is um, having your swing leg create drag by not coming forward quickly enough. And so, and this is particularly an effective trip for hip flexors. Um, it will also help with quads, though. A uh, tight hip flexor usually just means that your hip flexor is trying to bring your leg forward at the same time that um, 
drag is holding it back. And so your hip flexor gets pulled at, and then you experience tightness and is very uncomfortable. If you then respond by trying to stretch it, you've just made the problem worse. But if instead you help your hip flexor to do the thing that it's trying to do, which is shorten, if you help it to do that by bringing your knee forward more quickly, you'll feel a lot of relief. And you'll also find that your effort goes down in running and you'll also speed up a little bit, which can be a nice perk. Um, tight quads are usually because your pelvis is behind your standing foot in mid stance. And again, the drag from the swing leg can be a reason why that's happening. Also, you can speed your center of gravity up in its process of moving forward by bringing your knee forward a little quicker. So I'm not talking about lifting your knees up as in the classic old coach's advice, but uh, just bringing your knees forward. So that's tight quads and hip flexors. Tight calf muscles. Um, tight calf muscles are generally a result of a torso that is too stiff. And so your poor little foot and calf is trying to push this stiff block along, and it's a lot of work. And you're, what you need is for the, your whole body to cooperate with your calf a bit better and assist. And so ways that you can do that are by lengthening your warm-up so that you're a little looser when you start running. Um, a lot of people just step right out the door and start running, but your trunk is fairly stiff. And although you loosen up over time, it's not the same as if you walked first and then ran. And um, I find that runners usually interpret this as quite bad news. <laughs> and I have to add 10 minutes to my run. Um, but try it and you'll see. Actually, everybody could try that and we'll see actually you feel much better um, when you're running by the even at the end of your run and afterwards. So lengthen your warm-up so that your torso is more mobile. And then you can do some side bends and twists as a warm-up. Now keep this in the movement category and not the stretching category. Don't do a big stretching side bend and then the other side. But just um, do a little less so that you don't feel a stretch. You just feel movement. And then keep your body moving and do some twists. Just gentle. Again, no stretching, no pushing. Just encouraging your spine to move and your hips to move. And then think of letting your hips and your back move more when you run. And I think you'll find that your calves don't need to work nearly as hard then and they're not as tight. So knee pain, including IT band syndrome. So you could, knee pain could be a classic runner's knee, patellofemoral pain, which is in the front of the knee or just below the kneecap. It could be on the outside of the knee, which is IT band syndrome. Or you could also have... Sometimes people have pain on the inside of the knee. You could have pain anywhere around. So um, for, for these situations, the main thing that really helps is getting your pelvis moving. And by that, I don't mean um, turn your running into a salsa dance. <laughs> because your pelvis needs to move the amount that's appropriate for moving forward. There is such a thing as too much. Um, and so I normally use the verb let or allow instead of make. So you want to let your pelvis move. You want to stop stopping it. Uh, so let it move more. Notice what moving it does. And pre-run, you can also warm up with range of motion exercises for both legs, especially focusing on the leg that doesn't hurt. Of course, if both knees hurt, then don't have a special focus you just do both sides um, but people tend to give all their attention to the leg that hurts when um, usually it's the other side that needs to change more um, and uh, so if you do range of mo you, you always want to do exercises on both sides but if you know that your main goal is to free up the side that doesn't hurt so it can move more easily you'll find that the side that does hurt starts to work better all right, uh, plantar fascia problems. And I've avoided the, um, these, it used to be called plantar fasciitis. Um, it's now more often called plantar fasciosis. Um, but um, we don't have to quibble over that. If you've got pain on the bottom of your foot, <laughs> um, people ha if you have pain on the bottom of your foot, people have told you to stretch, I'm sure. Please stop. That will really, really slow down your recovery. And if you're wearing one of those socks that holds you in a stretch position in bed at night, 
please stop. You could untuck your sheets at the bottom so that your foot isn't being pulled into um, a um, pointed as a position that's the, the polar opposite. Um, but you, you need to get your calves, your feet and your calves working properly again. And all of the stretching and the holding in a lengthened position yeah, interfere with that. Uh, you need to do a good glute warm-up. And uh, your feet will feel much better if you can get your glutes working well. So this could be a lunge sequence. Um, it, lunge mat the lunge matrix is a popular thing for runners to do now. Lunges in different directions. Single leg squats. And breathe into your belly when you run. Because the overriding problem with plantar fasciitis is that your weight is too far back. It's a similar thing to, to having tight quads. Um, your weight is too far back, and so you're trying to push off your foot. At the same time, your weight is back on it, and this results in a pulling and a tearing at the soles of your feet. Again, micro tears, so, you know, and don't um, get too hung up on that picture. <laughs> the thing is, you just don't want to tear it more with stretching. Um, you need to um, start, uh, you need to shift your body weight forward so that that stress is relieved. And um, glute strengthening exercises and warm-ups will really help do that. Um, letting your pelvis move when you run, and even breathing into your belly so that any excess um, tension that you have in your flexor muscles, which tend to pull you into a fetal position, will be relieved. And your weight can be a bit more forward and your, can, your feet can work better. And you'll find that that over time relieves your stress on your soles of your feet. If you have Achilles tendon problems, do all of the above. Um, in, in some ways, that's the trickiest situation to just tell you what to do because it is so much about um, getting your whole body to cooperate together better and getting the center of gravity in the right place. And particularly if you have Achilles tendon problems associated with transitioning into more minimalist running footwear, Probably your hip flexors are over-contracted um, and you're running in a, in a bit of a flex position, even though you're trying not to, um, and probably your pelvis is not moving enough. All of the things that I've listed will help put your body in motion and get your weight forward and relieve some of the stress on your Achilles. So um, those are the concrete tips that I have to give you. And I always wish as a, as a blogger and as a video maker and as an educator that I could just tell the world how to run and everybody could run that way and we would all feel better and happy. Um, but I became a Feldenkrais practitioner when I learned that I had to really give lessons. I had to use my hands and I had to work with people in a, in a structured and in-depth situation with certain kinds of feedback involved to really create the kind of learning experience that makes substantial change. So um, I've given you the best information that I can in a webinar format and you can go forward from here um, a couple of different ways. Um, most of the advice that I'm offering I realize is way outside the box and uh, you may feel comfortable with that. You may feel like what's in the box has just not worked for you. Um, or you may not be so comfortable with that, um, which, is, which is fine. Everybody's got their own process. And so it is, a, it is an option for you to stick with the treatments that you're pursuing. They may eventually work. Um, and you may just need to pursue them a bit longer before you'd be comfortable trying something different from what your doctor or your physio says. Um, and so that is totally fine. So another option that you have is that um, with this information that I've given you, um, you can work your way towards feeling better on your own. You can stop doing the um, therapies that I've explained are harmful, that are not working and that are potentially harmful. Um, you can make the corrections that I've just listed for your specific injury type and look for ways to make your running te technique easier and you will find that things improve for you. It may not be very rapid, 
progress, but those are the main tools that you need. Um, and so that is a viable option for you. Um, option number three is to follow a structured, tested, effective system, um, namely the Feldenkrais lessons that I've learned to create to help runners make these kinds of changes. And it will allow you to apply what I'm talking about in this webinar and get much quicker and more profound results than working on your own. And so what I'd like to do now is tell you a bit about the programs that I've developed um, in, so that you can make an informed decision about option number three. Um, that is one crowded slide, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the option that I have now come to being able to offer to runners everywhere and not just in the city where I'm located, um, thanks to the wonders of the internet, is an online running technique camp. So I have been um, working with a certain set of lessons for the nearly 13 years that I've been working with runners. I've tested them fully in many different formats. I've experimented, gotten feedback, and experimented again with sequences. And out of this, I have been able to create a six-week camp that will transform your running technique. And I know that this will work for any runner. And here's what I cover in this camp. Um, these, um, the materials that I send out to cover this are um, sent via email. They're, um, uh, most of them are audio recorded Feldenkrais lessons. And so this allows you to, um, this allows you to fit the program into your own schedule rather than being online at a particular time of day. So there's a lot of flexibility built in. So in week one, I send you lessons that focus on developing your ability to perform the core action, the ability of your pelvis to move. And this is the heart and soul of balanced running technique. And if you've read my blog at all, um, you'll find you, you've heard of the core action because almost whatever I write about, it comes down to that. It's not the only thing, but with that there, without that, there isn't much else possible. So week one, the core action, the, the movements of your pelvis, your abdomen, and your upper body that um, uh, create healthy running technique. And the um, most immediate effect people get from this is if they have uncomfortable knees, their knees start feeling much better, particularly for runner's knee patellofemoral syndrome. Week two is about gravity and glutes. So it's a kind of lesson that lets you handle and channel ground reaction force to make your running easier and to reduce the stress on your feet to move your center of gravity forward. If, uh, if anyone has ever told you that you're not using your glutes when you run or that your glutes are weak, um, the lesson that we do in week two will solve that problem. Um, and uh, so this really relieves stress on the feet, the ankles, and the hamstrings. So if your problems are plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, anything around the ankle or hamstring problems, you really see an improvement. Week three, we look at the arm-hip connection, which um, makes a huge difference for runners who struggle with shoulder tension um, or discomfort, or even, I've even had runners who get numbness or tingling in their arm. Um, and this, the lesson that we do this week um, will really change that. It will also give you control over your speed and so that you can use this arm-hip connection to change your speed, and that gives you a bit more technical control when you're running. Because running at different speeds always means running different ways. It involves changes in your movement, and not just doing the same thing, but harder or faster. Um, week four is the obliques and gluteus medius, and this particularly uh, has a great effect for anybody who's struggling with problems with their IT bands. Um, and any kind of asymmetry, it balances the two sides of your body and um, further refines your foot strike. So any lingering problems with your foot strike kind of fade away and um, any problems with your lean also fade away and um, uh, running just gets a lot easier. In week five, we do a lesson that brings the preceding four weeks together all into one set of movements. Um, and gives you warm-up and early run and mid-run options 
um, of things to do so that you can um, tune your technique and feel good in every run. And week six uh, takes it to the next level. So week six is the well-armed week where we focus on organizing your head and your shoulders and your arms. And I have found over the past 13 years, the higher up in your body you make a change in your running technique, the bigger an effect it has. And that's because of um, the effect of gravity. You know, um, higher up affects everything, lower down. It affects how you're balanced and how your whole body is able to work. And um, so this is the really the take it to the next level week. Um, so those are the things that we, re that we cover in that camp. The camp also includes live webinars. Uh, covering an in-depth explanation of how running works from the perspective of human gait and not just from within the running community. And key shifts that you can make in your approach to running and your mindset so that you'll be a healthier and better runner for the rest of your life. And here I have a lovely testimonial from a participant in my camp last summer. And this is a, a common experience for people who work with me, either in my camp or one-to-one. -one. So John says, I have been doing a number of things to increase my stride angle and speed for the same effort. Having my multifidus palpated to increase range, active isolated stretching from hip flexors and quads, working on and strengthening gently my hamstrings, lidiard hill exercises, Pilates reformer, losing weight, plus other stuff. But it's the Feldenkrais that makes the big difference. And so this is my wish for you that your running dreams come true. And before we conclude, let me just tell you a little bit more about how you can find my only running technique camp and how you can access it um, in the next 10 days at a reduced price. Um, and um, then um, I will take questions and answers and we can finish. So now I'm going to attempt the feat of continuing my screen share, but showing you a different screen. So, I see you there. I am going to, that is a different campaign. So, I'm currently running a campaign on Indiegogo, a crowdfunding campaign. If you're not familiar with crowdfunding campaigns, that is, uh, is simply a kind of fundraiser because I would really like to expand the Balanced Runner and offer my help to more runners. Um, but I need some funds to, to do that, to invest in my business. And so um, you'll find the campaign, and I'll send you the link to this following the webinar, webinar along with the replay. Um, but here is the Balanced Runner Indiegogo campaign. And right now, access to the Balanced Runner online technique camp is available through this campaign at 60% off the full price. Now, um, can everybody nod if you are seeing my campaign page? Good, all right, thank you. And so um, you'll find on my campaign page a whole lot more about um, the uh, background behind what I do, how the balanced runner works, and um, the pro runners that I've worked with. Um, and you will also find down here the online running technique camp. And you see it's priced at $99. The full price is $260, the price of two pairs of trainers and running shoes. So um, very reasonable considering what money you might go through trying to solve your problem. Probably already have spent trying to solve your problems. Um, but it's available again uh, just until the end of this campaign, which is Friday, February 20th. Um, for $99. And so if you go to this page and just click on this link, um, you can register there. The next camp begins May 15th and runs for six weeks. There are additional options. If you're a professional who works with runners, there's the pro camp and master class um, where you will get additional resources on how to apply what you learn in the camp to your work in your professional scope of practice. Um, if you would like me also to analyze your running form via video and consult with you one-to-one -one during the camp, 
there is the VIP option, which is $225. And that again is 60% off the full projected price of 550. So I'll be accompanying you through the camp and being personally involved in your learning process. Um, and then there's the, there are the options that include the master class. The master class is a monthly online class that I offer to people who have um, graduated from my camp, who have worked with me one-on-one -on -one so that they can uh, keep learning and growing as runners. And um, there's more about that in the description here on the page, and I'm also very happy to answer questions about that as well. So those are the options. Um, I will email you the Indiegogo URL. Uh, uh, in the follow-up email after this webinar. And so again, that, that concludes um, what I wanted to talk with you about. Um, I uh, would be very happy to take questions at this point. So if you are there and have a question, um, please unmute yourself and um, ask away. And since we've got a small group live, there may not be any. Are there any questions about the tips that I gave for specific running injuries and how to deal with them? All right. Well, since I know that the majority of people who signed up for this webinar are not actually here live, let me invite you to email me with any questions that you have following this. Um, and any feedback you have from me. I hope very much that it's been helpful to you. Um, you know, if, if you signed up for this webinar, um, you've probably been struggling with your body for a while. And you've probably been to doctors and done some physio and Googled it and read up on Runner's World and everywhere um, about the problems that you're having. And so I hope that you will take this opportunity not to lose any more time to your running injuries, but take advantage of this offer that I have through the end of um, uh, next week. And join my running camp um, because I created it for you. And uh, in conclusion, I do wish for you that all your running dreams come true.